Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We've been in a series called Stories of Jesus. Today's story is the feeding of 5,000. Has anybody ever heard the story of the feeding of 5,000? Yes? I'm sure our children have learned it. And let's go ahead and read it today out of the book of John. Children, I promise to make this fun and fast. Is that all right? We're going to get through this quick. John 6, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. You see, seeing your miracle is the second phase of faith, right? If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but then you must see it. These people are seeing the manifestation of the word that they've heard, all right? They saw the signs. Then Jesus went up to the mountainside. He sat down with his disciples. It was the Jewish Passover. It was near. When Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip, so Jesus says to Philip, where shall we buy food for all these people to eat? Watch this. He asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. It was a setup. Philip, how are we going to feed everybody? Jesus already knew that he was going to perform a miracle. He already knew that he was going to duplicate bread and feed everybody. I want you to know today that maybe Jesus might ask you some questions in your life that he already knows the answer to, but you don't yet have the faith for it. Amen. Sometimes he'll ask you a question to build faith in your heart. Philip answered, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each person to have a bite. Now, in another version of the Bible, it says it would cost 200 denarii to feed all these people. 200 denarii today would be about $11,000. It would be $11,000 for everybody here to get a bite. Now, let's just think about that for a second. The Bible says that they fed 5,000 men, which means that did not include women and children. Could it be that maybe there was 11,000 people? 11,000 people that was going to be fed by this miracle that Jesus did? Another disciple, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves of bread. But how far will this go among so many? Now hear me, I think we ask this question a lot of ourselves. How can I make a difference in the world around me with only what I have to work with? I'm not important, I'm not outgoing, I'm introverted, I don't have a lot of talents, I don't have a lot of abilities. How could I possibly make a difference in the world with just five barley loaves? This can't do anything. Just remember this, one paint roller can paint a whole room pretty quick. There's a lot one can do, there's a lot one person, there's a lot of a difference one person can make. He took the five pieces of barley loaf and he gave thanks. Father, today we thank you for the preaching of your word. We thank you for this bread. Feed us, Lord. He blessed the food. And as he reached into the basket, he began to pull out what would multiply over and over again. Over and over again. Five small barley loaves turned into enough bread to feed the multitude. Five barley loaves as he reached in, multiplied and multiplied and multiplied to feed more and more and more. I don't know what God needs to multiply in your life where you think that you may lack or be falling short, but God wants to do a miracle in your own life. God wants to multiply the dead things, the small things, the broken things in your life. Watch this. Five loaves and two fish. We're not going to talk about the fish today. Because if I multiplied fish enough to feed everybody, it would be pretty smelly in here. Today we're going to just look at the bread. When they 
had given everybody enough to eat. Jesus said, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered it all and they filled 12 baskets of leftovers. Think about that. Now, I'm going to talk to the kids for a moment. How many pieces of bread did we start with? Five. And how many baskets of leftovers did they take back? Twelve. Five small pieces of bread had 12 baskets of leftovers. In the room today, there are 12 buckets of bread, full of bread, to feed everybody in the room today. we got to remember this number 12, okay? 12 baskets of leftovers. After, they, after the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, now pay attention, surely this is the prophet who is coming to the world. They, they called him a prophet. They didn't call him, surely this is God. They did not say, surely this is the Messiah. They're saying, surely this is a prophet who's coming to the world. And watch, Jesus knowing that they intended to come make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. I want to look at this. That last phrase is very important. They called him a prophet. And indeed, he was a prophet. The best prophet of all. But in order to be a bona fide prophet, you had to prove you were a prophet. There must be proof. You must say something that no one else knows by the unction of God, and it must come to pass. If you came and gave a word from God and it didn't happen, you were a false prophet. And you know what the penalty of being a false prophet was? Death. Death. They would kill you. In fact, have you ever heard somebody say, do not use the Lord's name in vain? And we normally say it in conjunction to somebody saying a curse word. But that's not really using the Lord's name in vain. That's just cussing. <laughs> using the Lord's name in vain is saying God said something God didn't say. That penalty is death. Is death. And I'll just say there's a lot of people in the church world who say God says a whole lot of stuff that God ain't saying. I'm just saying. But this miracle right here, the feeding of the 5,000, was a miracle to prove that he was gr a greater prophet than any other. Are you ready? Here's the deep end. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in 1 Kings 17, multiplies oil and flour to feed a widow that feeds him. Flour and oil are the main ingredients to bread. P Elijah the prophet was great, but now I want you guys to play along. But Jesus is greater. Say it with me. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. All right, so each time I say that, I want you to yell it out, okay? Elisha. In 2 Kings, so you have Elijah. Then Elisha came after Elijah. Elisha had a double portion of Elijah's anointing. Elisha, in 2 Kings 442, multiplies 20 loaves of barley bread to feed over a hundred men. Elisha is great, but Jesus is greater, right? So Elisha fed a hundred people. Jesus is now feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. Moses was a great man of faith and power, but Jesus is greater. Moses led his people into the wilderness. While in the wilderness, they are fed bread from heaven called manna. Manna, bread, fell from the sky so that they could eat. Moses is great, but Jesus is greater, you see, because Moses did receive bread from heaven, but Jesus is the bread from heaven. He is the bread of life. There are five books of Moses in the Old Testament called the Torah or the Pentateuch. Jesus starts with five barley loaves, and he's transforming the Mosaic law into something bigger and something greater and something more nourishing. Stones, rocks are not nourishing. 
You can't eat the law. The law is not palatable. The law will make you sick. The law only brings death, but bread brings life. All of this is happening in Jesus feeding the 5,000. He's taking something like the law of five barley loaves, five stones. He's turning them into something that can nourish everybody. The law was great. The law was perfect. But Jesus is greater. How many, this is for the kids. How many baskets of scraps were left over? Twelve. In the Bible, there's this number 12 that's used many times. There were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 patriarchs. There were 12 disciples that became 12 apostles. And Jesus sends out those 12 disciples, those 12 apostles. He says, go and gather what's left. And they grab 12 baskets of leftovers. Could it be that those 12 disciples grabbing those 12 baskets of leftovers was a symbol of a new covenant? Knowing that communion, communion with God, is one of the foundations of our faith? Could it be that before there was the Last Supper, there was a supper on a hill of 5,000 men, not including women and children? That Jesus was breaking his body over and over and over again, piece by piece by piece, so that we could all be fed? That, that, that there was no distinction. He was not holding back as to who could eat. He's showing that all who are hungry can come feed on the body of Christ and be filled with nourishment. It's the bread of the new covenant. And I believe that the feeding of the 5,000 was a huge mass communion service. His body that was broken for us today is greater than any work you could possibly ever do in your life. Today, I want to take a moment and receive communion a little differently. We're not going to pass out wine or grape juice today. We're only going to do bread. We're not going to do any fish today because it would just be too smelly. We were going to give out Swedish fish and then we were going to give out goldfish. And it was, ah. The bread's the important part of this communion moment. And teens, if you're sitting on the side and your parents are in the room, could you kind of like shift to go find your parents? I want to have a moment here where families do communion together. And my heartbeat, hear me, pay attention. This is, listen, the rest of the sermon isn't all that great. This is the part. <laughs> that was okay. This is the part that I want to get to. I want the head of the household to assert themselves as the head of the household this morning spiritually. Whatever that looks like in your family unit, in your family dynamic, whoever the head of the household is, I want you to pray a blessing over your family. Now, if you're a single person here today, you are the head of your household, you're going to pray this over yourself, all right? When, when your boy gets sick, your boy lay hands on himself and prays for himself, right? When, when you get further along in your faith, you don't have to call for the elders of the church for healing. You lay hands on yourself, position to heal thyself, right? And so you can bless yourself. But if there's a dad in the room, there's a mom in the room that is the head of a household, I want you to take this moment and I want you to bless your family as we take communion. Now, I understand why a lot of men have a hard time being the spiritual head of their house. And it's just because they don't know what to say. They just know what to do. I'd love to be that. I'd love to do that. But I think sometimes, can, now, can I, can I go to men's defense for one moment? I think females in the church want their husband to be a lot like the TV preacher. But that's not what their calling is. That TV preacher is a TV preacher. Your husband's not that. Your husband's a mechanic. He's a, a, he's, he's a businessman. He's... He's a hard worker, he's blue collar, white collar, whatever. Like, please don't ever try to make your husband something that he's not called to be. Amen. But I do believe that men, given the proper tools, would be more of a spiritual leader in their home if they just knew what to do. Now, I am being a little biased towards fathers in the room. It's just a vision that I had. 
I believe that if I can reach fathers, if I can reach husbands, we can create the next generation of fathers. I'm going to make a shift real quick. I just need to shift here real quick. There's a problem in our church world today. There's a problem in society today that parents raised good kids, but parents didn't raise parents. Fathers didn't raise fathers. They raised good sons, and they've kept them as sons. There's a problem when a father won't get out of the way and let his son be a father. We've seen it in the church. In the church world, there's these guys who, they're 75, 80 years old, still being the main pastor of the church, and they won't get out of the way for the son to be the father. At what age does the son become a father? At what age does a son who now has his own kids and grandkids become the father that everyone goes to? Today in this spirit, I believe that we need to take a shift. That brothers need to be fathers. Sons need to be fathers. And we take that role seriously. Not just physical fathers, that's an easy task. Spiritual fathers. Something unseen. A work you're not going to ever get credit for, accolades or praise. Because it's the things that you do in private. It's the things that you do in private that make you the spiritual leader in your home. Today, I don't know what your demographic is. I don't know what your family unit is. And I really hope that I'm not isolating anybody with what I'm about to do. But I want your home to be blessed. And I want you to lead that blessing. So I have written a prayer out that's going to be on the screen. And you're not going to repeat it after me. You're just going to pray it out loud over your demographic, over your home, of what that looks like. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't want to stand in a place of judgment. But what I do hope is that maybe there's some healing. Maybe there's a peace of God that reigns in your family. Maybe your child that hasn't been so great at school has a better has the best year they've ever had this year. Because you're kind of taking the lead spiritually in your home. As a family unit, could you stand with me please? As Jesus passed out the bread, he gave thanks. And as we pray this prayer, I want each of you in the family unit as we're praying this, just to bite off a piece as we're praying it. Let's go ahead and put it up on the screen. You pray this out loud. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. As the head of my household, I lay before you the 2022-2023 school year and fiscal year for my family. I trust you, Lord, to lead guide and direct me to make the right decisions this year that will help best help my family lead my family I bless my children in the name of Jesus the name that is above every other name I bless my spouse in the name of Jesus my family is the head and not the tail above only and never beneath my family is blessed in the city and blessed in the field Everywhere my family's feet walk is blessed because we are children of the Most High God. Lord, I thank you that everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful. I pray for protection over them and help guard their hearts and their minds. Protect them at school and at work. By the authority given to me by God our Father, I declare this blessing fulfilled in my family's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.